It's great to welcome to the show today Mitch Prinstein, who's the chief science officer of the American Psychological Association, professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and also author of the book Popular Finding Happiness and Success in a World That Cares Too Much About the Wrong Kinds of Relationships. Mitch, it's so great to have you on there. There are so many different places we could start, but let's just start with something that's in the book and then go from there. You write about how and the ways in which popularity, particularly in youth, influences our development and then ends up influencing success, happiness and our circumstances later in life. And I couldn't help but think of uh, thinking back to when I first moved to the United States. English is my second language. It was very anxiety producing to talk in front of the class, especially to read out loud in front of the class until it was something I got familiar with. With my show now, we estimate our daily audience is like one point five million people. But there's no association with the show and that phase of my life. So it's not stressful to me at all. But even when speaking in front of a small in person group, I feel a twinge of that from when I was a kid. Is this the sort of pass through that you talk about when you talk about our awareness and relationships in these ways as kids and how it can still affect us later? Yeah, what a great example. That's exa that's exactly right. You know, and it was only recently that research was done where they looked at what happens in the moment that we are in a social situation. You know, what areas of the brain seem to get activated? And what was surprising is that there's a lot of the hippocampus that gets activated. And that's the region where we store long term memories. And it kind of told us, you know, everything we're doing today we're kind of playing it through a filter that we built many years ago, those long-term memories, those experiences when we were young. And we're still comparing everything we see today with our kind of former selves and all the worries and the concerns and the memories that we, we have back then. So in a very real way, that old version of us is still part of the conductor, the director of how we act every day now. I'm curious whether you think that still talking about kids and adolescents, have the standards for popularity changed at all? And the reason I'm curious about this is my girlfriend and many of my friends are psychotherapists and they work with a lot of adolescents. And what I hear from a lot of them is that right now, family wealth seems to play a significant role in who the popular kids are in school. Now, I don't remember it being that way at all when I was in middle school, high school. Never mind that it wasn't totally clear who the wealthy kids were. I remember it being more about who's good at sports or who's perceived as attractive or it. Has there been a change in what now makes a pop generates popularity in some of these school settings? Yeah, the, the big factors have stayed the same. So physical appearance and social behavior. But then there's that miscellaneous category of what does society value? And for mm. some people in their town and their community, it's who's the big leader in the church or in the place of worship. For some, it's who's the best athlete. You know, for others, it's wealth or clothing or, you know, but that piece is very culturally prescribed. And we're talking about all the way to the level of what's cool in that particular school. So a lot of this is probably just a reflection of where the therapists I know are working rather than any one thing that is now kind of nationally uh, prescriptive of popularity. Yeah, that might be. And also where we are as a society today, you know, we've kind of moved from caring about things like wealth or material goods more and less over the years. And we might be in a position where people are really interested in those kinds of markers of status more than they used to be. I recently had my uh, 20 year high school reunion and inevitably a lot of the conversations are the sort of remember when X, Y, Z did ABC sort of stuff. But with my closer friends, we've talked a lot about how those who were more popular in high school are overwhelmingly not the ones that have done the best by adult standards when it comes to 
relationships or job status or finance. Now, I know I went to a, a relatively diverse school in terms of economic backgrounds, et cetera. I know people who went to a private school where everyone was high achieving and everybody's doing well as adults. But I'm curious what the research shows about popularity earlier and how it relates to what we might call traditional metrics of, of success in adulthood. Yeah, so that that really does fit the research very well. And it really shows us that there are what are two different kinds of popularity. And that's a you know big focus of, of why people get so confused on this sometimes. So one kind starts being relevant from when we're like three or four. You can already tell who's the most likable mm. and who's the least. But the other kind comes on board for in America around fifth, sixth grade. Suddenly there's that kind of status. You know, and even kids use the word popular to talk about them. Who's the most influential, dominant, you know, gets the most attention? Well, that form of popularity, that that status form of popularity, it used to peak in high school and then, you know, kind of go away. Now we live in a world where people are still chasing status their whole lives. But it's actually related to all these negative outcomes. People who have high status end up getting hired, but more often fired, hmm. demoted relationship problems, addiction difficulties, anxiety, depression, even their romantic partners and their friends tell researchers, yeah, I don't really enjoy spending a lot of time with that former high status or current status seeking person because they're kind of using me. This is all the opposite for likability. The kids who have that kind of popularity, those who are making others feel valued and included and you want to spend time with them, not only do they have great outcomes and all these professional and psychological factors, but they actually live longer and they have less diseases. Their kids do better. So a stark contrast between these two different kinds of popularity. To what degree do we think that this is nature versus nurture when it starts being noticeable, at least in terms of likability as, as early as age three and kind of connected to that? Sometimes I, I've, I've read a number of journal articles that look at introversion versus extroversion connected to different factors. It seems that a bunch of this is sort of weighted against introverts by its nature. Is that is that possible? Introverts are a, high, a heterogeneous group, right? So you've got some introverts that really are uncomfortable being around others, and that might not be a great thing. But then you've got introverts who are just a little bit more quiet and thoughtful before they enter into a conversation or they actually do quite well. They can be very likable because they tend to read the room and know mm. how to enter into a group really thoughtfully. So it's a little bit less introvert extrovert. There are some genetic factors though, right? Those super impulsive people or people who can't handle a lot of emotion we call that a temperament characteristic, and that can be heritable. Physical attractiveness is definitely a factor. Intelligence is a factor. And just generally, um, some of our social skills seem to have a heritable component. A lot of this, though, is nurture, which means we also have the opportunity to change it. Hmm. You know, the way we learn how we interpret other people's behavior and how we behave when we're with others, that's all stuff we can modify. When it comes to social media as a layer on top of this, when I was growing up, the way in which you sort of I don't know if evaluated is the right word, but sort of observed and understood personality, likability and started to make relationships was very much based on the kind of in person presentation of others. One of the things that for me personally has been true of social media is that sometimes a relationship will start with someone, a colleague or someone in my space or whatever through social media. And then eventually when we meet in person, to put it lightly, they're extraordinarily socially awkward where it's really, really difficult in person to connect in anything approximating the way that a friendship would have developed when I was 15, for example. What's been the effect of social media in kind of I don't know if it's sense making or king making or whatever it might be in terms of setting people up for where they are going to be in terms of real and perceived status. Yeah, great question. Let's think about what social media pulls for. First of all, what kind of popularity 
is it pulling for? Does social media reward us when we make others feel valued and included and happy? Or does mm. it reward us when we have the loudest voice, we're the most dominant and influential, right. right? So it's really designed to focus on one kind of popularity more than the other. The other thing is it's it kind of strips away a little bit of the humanity, right? So when I log in after my birthday, let's say, it will say, hey, you got, you know, 200 birthday greetings. It doesn't tell me who they are. It doesn't link to their profiles. It doesn't encourage me to get to know more about them. It just says 200 people, you know? And so it's taking away some of the skill building that you need to develop a friendship, emotional vulnerability, disclosure, reciprocity. You know, these are the things that you need when you're in person and you're connecting with somebody on, you know, what we used to think of as a real human level. I guess one could argue that a positive thing about social media is I mean, tell me tell me if my instinct is right on this. There are probably folks who struggle to connect in the real world, but who are better able to form some relationships if they at least start online. Is that a possibility? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, for people that are experiencing pretty big deficits, Social media slows down the interaction a little bit so they can really like investigate somebody in their interests and find mm. the thing to say. It can help them practice skills that are really hard to do in person. Um, you know, people that are experiencing depression can find others experiencing depression, for example, and they can find a way to talk about that. And that doesn't come up in conversation too quickly with a stranger. So there can be some benefits for people who are otherwise having a lot of difficulties. Can you talk a little bit about what's known about the link between what we might call high status as an adult and depression, anxiety, substance abuse, relationship problems in terms of the mechanics of what what can be at play there? So when we think about status as compared to likability, we're really talking about people who can can get their dominance and attention through really good means. They can just be great leaders. But more often than not, aggression is something that leads people to get high status, subtle hmm. or even pretty severe and overt ways of bullying others or putting them down. And the problem is in high school, there's a tolerance for that. You know, the bullies do get some reward for being kind of at the top of the heap when they show how, how you know, powerful they are compared to others. But that just doesn't play in adulthood in the same way. So they learn these skills to be aggressive and then enter the adult world and that doesn't work out. So they suddenly find, wait a minute, I'm really craving all this status. I knew how to get it before and now I don't anymore. And I don't really, and I've lost the chance to learn how to connect with people. So what happens is that people who had a high status and are still looking for status, they're, they've lost the skill on how to connect with others in a, in a kind and collective way they're being a little bit aggressive or maybe using others to kind of get themselves more status. And as a result, they actually see that their relationships are not going so well and they tend to get pretty lonely and depressed. Is this something in so going back to the through line between personality, likability, popularity in childhood through to circumstances as an adult, how much of this is changeable once you've entered adulthood? Is it only through extensive therapy and and consideration and self self analysis or can simply seeing the reactions of people to one in the real world be enough to reorient you? Yeah, I don't think we need like intensive therapy in order to change it. We do need to take a peek at our adolescence for a moment and just say, what are some of the things I learned there? It's unlikely that they just disappeared as I got older. I probably learned something and that might still be playing out a little bit. There's still a filter that I've got, you know, that I'm, I'm looking through. We call those cognitive biases. And, you know, for some people that filter is, you know, in a situation where I'm confused what's happening, I tend to assume people are being mean. Hmm. Or maybe the opposite. I tend to assume that people are lavishing me with praise, even though, you know, there might be moments where they they could have some critical or some helpful feedback. So the first thing we got to do is got to approach that bias and say, all right, what is the filter that I might be using? And then we have to put ourselves in a little bit of a tricky position to say, you know, I'm going to just 
not make that assumption a few times. And I'm going to say, I, you know, I feel like maybe someone was being mean, but let me just check in on that for a second and ask those around me or someone close to me, you know, did you also see it that way? And we're sometimes surprised to realize that we're unwittingly contributing to replaying the patterns over and over again. We realize, wait a minute, if I just don't assume that someone was being mean to me and I approach it in a very neutral way, it actually makes the interaction go pretty well. But if I assume they're being mean and then I get hostile in return, well, it's guaranteed to turn into a pretty bad interaction. So right. it takes a little bit of that trial and error. Mitch, last thing I want to ask you about, and, and this is something I've generally it's a bit of a departure from what we're talking about, but, but I think related, just curious on your thoughts. Uh, I get a lot of hate mail. And sometimes the hate mail is the sort of stuff where if it was ever published, it, it would be humiliating to me if I were ever caught saying some of these things. I used to get very defensive and reactive. But the more I think about it and I think to myself, you know, I've never written to anyone whose content I watch. And if I did, I certainly wouldn't insult them and use horrible slurs and all these different things. What must be going on in the life of the person who is sending this sort of stuff. And I assume that they are the ones that are struggling and I get kind of sad and then I move on. Is my instinct that those who are willing to say such things over the Internet to people they don't even know, is it more about them than it is about me as the target? Or is that maybe it's just something I tell myself to feel better? No, I think that I think that you're onto something. There are two things that we've learned from this kind of current culture where people are free to say what whatever they want, no matter how you know drastic. One is is that people who tend to participate in the in the response, whether it's the comment section of an article that they read or it's writing to someone you know that they might have heard through media, is you tend to get the vast extremes of the continuum there, right? Mm. So no one ever writes to say, you know, I had generally neutral feelings about <laughs> what I just experienced and I wanted to share that with you. So, you know, you're usually getting the extremes. So you have to remember that the vast majority of the planet lives in the middle of the bell curve, not on the extremes. The people um, who think I'm doing a five out of 10, I don't hear from. Yeah, they're not going to take the time to write that. We're all just right. too busy. But the second thing is that we're in an era of depersonalization. So people are no longer interacting with one another as humans, knowing that you're a, a person that has a range of feelings and experiences. You do a lot of things that you're probably proud of. And there are some things that you probably think that wasn't my best. And I'm already aware of that. You know, that, that's the normal human experience. We now kind of don't look at people that way. We look at them as you know, the epitome of everything that we love or everything that we hate. And we kind of feel sh free to share that with somebody as if they are emblematic of everything we want to stand up for or against. Right. We kind of forget that, wait a minute, these are these are people and these are humans and we're all just doing our best. And we've lost that compassion and empathy a bit. Uh, yeah, a lot of lack of compassion in my inbox. That's uh, that's for sure. We've been speaking with Mitch Princeton. The book is popular. Finding happiness and success in a world that cares too much about the wrong kinds of relationships. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. Sure. Thank you.